If you're a fan of motorsports, and NASCAR in particular, you're in a treat for today. NASCAR is the National Association for Sports Car Auto Racing. In the southern United States during Prohibition, if you were of an entrepreneurial bent and had an automobile, you would find there was opportunity to transport parcels of the liquid variety across the countryside. Unfortunately, black and white cars with lights on their roofs didn't think that was a good occupation. So consequently, if you were creative, you decided the only solution was more horsepower. And on Saturday, you had an opportunity to talk about that, and on Sunday, challenge your friends to see who had the best bragging rights. That is the origin of NASCAR in the southern United States. Two weeks ago, at the Daytona International Speedway, the NASCAR season began at the Daytona 500 race. It's a two-and-a-half-mile tri-oval. This year, they've renovated the facility and added 40,000 seats. Their posted seating capacity is 168,000 seats. In 1959, a gentleman by the name of Lee Petty won the first Daytona 500 to the striking amount of $19,000. Last year, sorry, two weeks ago, Joey Logano from Team Penske brought home a tidy $1.5 million. Just to give you an idea of the scope of NASCAR. In uh, one of our members brought a clipping from yesterday's free press, quoting our guest and talking about NASCAR mm. and its development. Gene Stefanishin, our guest this morning, has been with General Motors for more than 30 years, most recently serving as their executive director for global product development. Through his career, Gene has held roles in all facets of vehicle design, development, global project management, engineering strategy, finance management, and quality control. He joined NASCAR in 2013 and is the Senior Vice President of Innovation and Racing Design and is based in NASCAR's Research Facility Center in Concord, North Carolina, which, depending on the weather, he was unfortunately disappointed to leave yesterday and I'm sure to get back tonight. Temperature in the high 40s, he tells me. As part of the senior leadership team, Gene is one of four senior vice presidents who works with their president, recently rolling out successful product innovations of the new generation NASCAR 6 race car, the air Titan track cleaning system, numerous safety innovations, and improved systems, uh, fuel systems for the car. He's also assumed leadership roles and initiatives on building in the areas of racing performance, innovation, and the event experience, as well as safety engineering. Gene holds a Bachelor of Science degree in math, uh, Mechanical Engineering from Kettering University and an MBA from R. Western. During his career, he lived in Detroit, Michigan, Canada, Australia, Sweden, and Germany. He and his wife, Angela, are the parents of two children, Ivana and Mark. Please welcome Gene's definition. Well, uh, thank you, uh, and, uh, and good morning. Uh, I really do want to thank the uh, senior Western Senior Alumni Association for extending invitation, allowing me to come here and tell you a bit about NASCAR, which is, uh, you know, it's uh, people think about racing, but really we're in the, uh, in the entertainment business. So what I'll try to do here is I'll try to paint a bit of a picture of the, uh, of the business. I've kind of broken it into uh, three sections. I'll tell you a bit about the history and, and the business of NASCAR, focus a bit on uh, innovation and racing development, the part that I spend a lot of my time thinking and working about. And then we'll share some commercials to give you an idea of how we try to position the product for our fans and our customers. And then we'll, we'll wrap it up with a, with a Q&A session. So uh, a bit about the history. So uh, I actually, you did a good job on kind of uh, giving us a bit about that. But it was actually started by uh, uh, Bill Sr., Bill France Sr., uh, in 1948, and it's uh, headquartered at Daytona Beach, uh, and uh, it is a privately uh, family-owned business, and, and still is, and it's a family-operated business. The current chairman is Brian France, and he is, uh, the, he is the grandson of the founder, and uh, it is the number one uh, sanctioning body for motorsports in, in the United States of America, and the priority for us remains the quality of the product on the track, because we are in, in the entertainment business, so we want to make sure that people enjoy enjoy the product and it's a revenue-based sponsorship model uh, and it uh, injects funding and underwriting for teams and, and tracks. Now interesting enough 
Bill France had this vision and set this up, but he had, his wife was actually a very critical part of this. She did the books, and the story goes, she had two sets of books. There was one set of books she would show him, and then there was a real set of books, because uh, if she just let him run unfettered, he, they, this probably wouldn't have happened. So uh, a, lot of the, a lot of this is based uh, in her uh, fiduciary responsibility in making sure that uh, the money was spent in a wise way. Uh, we, in North Carolina, we have uh, offices in Charlotte, uh, the big office in Charlotte, there a lot of marketing stuff happens. Concord, where the R&D Center is, and in Conover, where we house a lot of the haulers that move from track to track. We also have offices in New York City uh, and in Los Angeles, and we have uh, our international offices. We have an office in Toronto for our Canadian series and one Mexico City for our, our Mexican, Mexican series. Uh, subsidiaries include... Uh, uh, ISC, the International Speedway Corporation, we race, I'll show you that shortly here, we race on uh, about 30 tracks and our sister company, we own 16 of those, 16 of those tracks and also we have, uh, we also own the IMSA, which is a different race product, which is uh, not as much middle America, it's more people with uh, you know, higher income brackets and uh, people that are, uh, you know, have more disposable income. So we have that, that's another product we position, and of course we have NASCAR Digital Media and a, a NASCAR Technical Institute. So that's, that's a bit about the history. Now this is kind of an overview of, of, of NASCAR. It really, most of what you've probably heard about is over there, the three, that's what we call the National Series level. There's actually 93 races at 50 events, and that happens over 40 weekends, all in 40 weekends. So you can imagine now, the production that goes behind us. We, we raced in Daytona, next weekend we're in Atlanta, then we're off to Las Vegas, from Las Vegas we're off to Phoenix, from Phoenix. So this whole circus gets picked up and moved every, every weekend. We bounce and the season starts on the 22nd of February with the Daytona 500 and it ends, culminates on the last race, the championship race in Homestead, Miami in the middle of November. So you know, that's about a nine month, nine and a half month season, 38 weekends. We race every weekend except for two, there are two open. So it's a, so basically that's the, the national series and we race uh, Sprint Cup, Xfinity and Camping World, Camping World are trucks. And then of course we have a whole bunch of regional and local uh, series. And then we have series in, uh, in Mexico and Canada. So overall there's 1200 events that happen in a year and all these different places. But most people that watch a lot of it on TV focus on those three. And it's a sponsorship model, so uh, Sprint is the sponsor. They've been the sponsor for 13 years for our top level. It's called the Sprint Cup Series. And then we just brought in Xfinity. It used to be Nationwide Insurance, now Xfinity has got a, we got a 10 year deal with Xfinity. They're the sponsor for that, uh, that series. And if we got uh, Camping World, who's the sponsor, we did a 10 year deal with them. They're a sponsor for that series. So the sponsorship model, we Sprint is with us until the end of 16. We are in market right now, attempting to find a new sponsor. And right now it's, uh, it's about a billion dollar deal for 10 years is what, is what we're shopping around to try to make happen on that one. So that's uh, a bit of uh, the overview. Now I told you we have, uh, uh, or I indicate we have another product. This is called uh, IMSA. And this is basically owned by NASCAR also. And these are all the other different series. That are, these are basically uh, road course racing. And we have the Tudor series, we have the development series, and we have this what we call single mate series where people race Ferraris, Lamborghinis. And of course we have the Porsche uh, series which we uh, race in Canada and the US. So that's another product, won't spend a lot of time talking about that, but just we have a middle America product and we have an upscale product uh, that, uh, for racing in the, in the United States and in Canada. So these are, and I don't want you to read all this, but these are the tracks we race on, okay? So these are, we have 30 tracks, and there are, we break them into four groups that are super speedways. There are the intermediate tracks, the short tracks, and the road courses. Uh, the intermediate tracks are around two and a half miles long, very high bank tracks, very high speed, a lot of drafting, different type of racing. We have the intermediate tracks. And of course, we have the short tracks. The smallest short track is a half a mile. And you can imagine, we put 43 cars on on the grid every weekend. So the race at Bristol is something like you've never seen before. 43 cars on this little half mile track and, and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty exciting really. 
Uh, and then, of course, we have the road courses, which uh, a lot of people aren't aware that we actually race in road courses, too. So we have, so actually our drivers are pretty skilled. They have to be able to drive on a road course, they have to be able to drive on these small tracks, they have to be able to drive in a drafting environment. So pretty, pretty diverse set of tracks. And you can, and you can see they all have different, different banking, different types of uh, shapes. So each one of these, it's not like a stick and ball sport where you go play basketball. I mean, the court is always the same. Every, every one of these, there's a specific engineering solution for that car, for that track. Because the guys look at the banking, they look at the speed. And so there's, there's like, for example, Henrik Motorsport, they have 500 engineers. They have four cars, and they have 500 engineers who work to determine these solution sets for these tracks to win, win the race. So as you can imagine, this schedule, we got to put together all the logistics, have people travel around to make all this happen. Uh, so it's sky, size and scope. It's actually the number one sport in fan brand loyalty. We have very, very, very loyal fans who are very loyal to the brands. Therefore, we have a sponsorship model that works quite well. It is the number two sport on television. A lot of people don't realize that. Uh, obviously, the big, the big juggernaut is the NFL, but we, we, we're, we're, we're second. Uh, we have more than 100 million unique viewers, and you, a unique viewer is somebody, if you've watched three races, we only count you once, but if you've watched it once, we count you as a unique uh, viewer. And it's the number one spectator sport, and a pretty big economic impact. It'll add 100 to 200 million to the local economies, and like I indicated before, it's a it's a it's a 10 month season. Uh, also, uh, here's a bit of the, the, the breakdown of the fans: 62 percent male, 38 percent female. 31 percent of our fans are between 18 and 34. Obviously, for us, we need to try to bring in new fans to millennials. That's a challenge, I think, for everybody. Anything we do, you know, how do you get young kids interested in uh, in your product? Disposable income, 47% of our, our fans have a disposable income of $50,000 or greater. And it's a pretty family-focused uh, kind, of, uh, kind of activity. And we try to cater that at the track. We have people, we try to let the kids are allowed to walk in the pit area. You know, they obviously have to be supervised. But uh, uh, so uh, now here is, uh, this, is, uh, this is the sports environment. We have the NFL. This is the average viewership per event right per event so um, you can see that uh, the NFL is the big one and we've got our Sprint Cup and then we got a nationwide and then we got a camping where you can see where the uh, where the NBA falls in where NHL hockey falls in this is obviously the United States and where baseball falls in so as far as sports we're pretty big uh, and that's what we view as our competition I mean we're in the racing business but we're in the entertainment business and so we actually do quite well but, but again, the NFL is, 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 is the big giant in this. And then when you look at us versus just motorsports, you can see we have uh, IndyCar there, we had drag racing, we have F1. You can see that we really, really dominate uh, the motorsports in, in North America. And we actually, I would say we have a bit, of a bit of a monopoly on it. But again, we don't view them as our competitors. We view hockey, basketball, football, those are our competitors, and we're fighting for those entertainment dollars, right? Uh, we have consistent and durable uh, audience. Uh, we get about seven million, seven and a half million viewers per event. Uh, we do pretty well on Nielsen's, and the, we have very, very, very loyal fans. This is an indication of fans who would, if we have an official sponsor, would they consider their products? And you can see with all the sports, that we, they will consider, they will recommend, or they will support. NASCAR is at the top of our fans are very loyal. They will buy the products that are on the car, if it's Tide soap or whatever it is. So this is very, very important to uh, people, sponsors, and uh, television. And this drives our basically our business model, a lot of this. Uh, and so it, our sponsorship and our partners, we have uh, nearly one in four are Fortune 500. We've had an 8% increase uh, since uh, 2008. And actually one in three are Fortune 100 companies, right? And the sponsorship is at three levels. This is the sponsorship at the NASCAR level. These are the kind of companies that are involved, right? So uh, actually you'll see here Sprint, obviously. They'll be replaced. Uh, nationwide was replaced with Xfinity, but these are at our corporate level. These are sponsors. 
uh, that, uh, that, that we have engaged. 3M is a big sponsor. These are sponsors that sponsor teams, race teams, right? So, for example, Lowe's. Lowe's, uh, they sponsor Jimmy Johnson. He's got the number 48 car, and he, they've got, you'll see that when Jimmy's racing, Lowe's is, is sponsoring him. And then we have a third level of uh, a sponsorship, which is at the tracks. So it's a three-tier sponsorship model, national teams and tracks. And these people invest money and activate uh, because they get a lot of TV coverage. And uh, it's good. Uh, it's good. And it's actually, we have companies who come in, have a very, very low um, awareness. We can really bump up their awareness a lot. So that's the sponsorship model. Uh, we just completed a big TV deal. Uh, it's a 10-year deal out through 2024. We've got two networks, Fox, and we've got uh, NBC Sports Network. Uh, 115 uh, million TVs, uh, household uh, television, uh, 115 million television households in the United States. Uh, Fox is in 90 million of them, and then uh, NBC Sports is in 78 million. NBC Sports is really ramping it up, so... Uh, the, you know, so we've got pretty good, pretty good network coverage here. This was a uh, 10-year deal at uh, $900 million. Um, so Fox, they have the, the first half of the season, and then NBC, they'll have the second half of the season. NBC will run some on their uh, over-the-air broadcasting, uh, NBC, and then they'll run some on cable, which is NBC Sports Network. So that's a mix of uh, conventional broadcast and cable broadcast. Uh, so, obviously, through the financial calamity in 2007, since a lot of our product is based in Middle America, the health of Middle America determines, you know, we, we saw a, a big downturn, as everybody did, and we're trying to rebuild that. So we came up with a, an industry action plan which focused on these key areas, make sure we have product relevance, event experience, capture millennials, go after the youth, multicultural, build up the, our drivers as stars, and also the digital social space. So those are our seven key priorities we've been working. I'll kind of go through and give you an idea on some of these things we've been doing. So at the track, obviously, we're trying to do everything here to make that experience good for the fans. As a matter of fact, in Daytona, uh, the Daytona International Speedway, there's a $400 million project going on right now. We're rebuilding that whole facility. We're introducing... Uh, putting escalators and redoing all the seating to be comfortable seats, uh, putting in uh, different uh, food venues, displays. So that whole, uh, that whole uh, reinvestment is part of our uh, activity to make the track experience very, very much fun. Driver star power, this is where we take our drivers and we try to put them, uh, we work with Hollywood to try to put them in places to build up so people know who they are. So for example, Dale Jr., Earnhardt Jr. there, he was in this one. That was 20 million impressions on the, uh, in the Funnier Die sketch. We had uh, uh, Eric Amarola here with William Levy. But, so you can see a lot of placement. Brad Kozlowski up there, who was a, for, was a champion uh, a couple years ago. So we tried to also build up uh, our stars so people know who they are. This is a program we've just kicked off. This is called Acceleration Nation. It is a STEM-inspired ma uh, marketing platform. And it offers, uh, and I'll show you a uh, commercial on this, but really, it's really trying to get into the schools and teach kids about STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, math. And we use racing as a way to do that because racing has so many principles of physics and kinematics and those types of things in it. So that's an important program for us. It's a three-pronged approach online in the school. We work with Scholastic. We've already developed teaching packages. We are handing out the schools to kids to learn about that, learn about science. And we also have, when the kids show up the track, we also help them see that kind of stuff at the track, talk to uh, uh, crew chiefs and that type of thing about how they put a car together. So there's a, there's a program there that helps us to teach kids about STEM, but also gets the youth involved in their sports. Uh, obviously, di digital is very, very important to us. We're doing a lot of work there trying to build that up. Uh, and we use this to try to pull people in and give them information, make the sport exciting. Now, this is, this is the way we view this. Traditionally, people have viewed all this stuff, Nielsen ratings, television, but that is really kind of uh, not uh, as relevant today. It's still very relevant, but you also need to bring all the other, other parts. So we look at TV. We look at uh, 
our digital space, and then we look at the social space. The social is pink, the digital is, uh, is yellow, and TV is blue. So this is a 2014 summary. We were the number one or two sport on uh, uh, every weekend. We had 5.3 million viewers per event, a total of 62 million unique viewers. You can see here in a digital space, we had a billion page views, 58 million video news. We had 4.6 million application downloads. And of course, a lot, a lot of traffic on social, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, etc. So this is an integrated approach, television, digital, and social to try to connect with. Very important, especially with the millennials and the youth, right? Um, so now that's a bit of a, a bit of a background. I'm going to talk to you a bit more for the people here who like technical stuff, this is what this will be a bit about. A bit about, this is where I spend a lot of my time, innovation, racing development. And basically, it's a very important, this is a, a model that requires a lot of collaboration. So in my work, I need to work with the drivers, I work with the team owners and, and the technical community, the racetracks, the OEMs. Uh, we have Toyota, Ford, and Chevrolet that, that race on the track, so I work with those guys. Broadcasters, we work with them sponsors and of course key vendors so it's a we work with those people NASCAR and we take all that and balance it to provide the fan with the best experience we think uh, that, 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 that we can give them. Um, this is the research center uh, as indicated it's in uh, Concord North, North Carolina it was opened in uh, 2003 uh, and actually it is the only research development of any motorsport sanctioning body I'm not aware of any other I don't think F1 has one, anybody else has one. So we have an R&D center, we have engineers there working on stuff, and I'll share some of the stuff we work on there. Okay, so now this is a chart that tries to explain what we do and why we do it. So the areas we work on are race analytics, the vehicle itself, the race infrastructure or the track where they race. We also work on the race event, what happens, how we, how we, how we show that event on television, fan engagement and systems and processes. So those are the what's, what we do, and this is why we do it. We do it to enhance competition. We do it to improve safety for our drivers and for our fans, for everybody. We also do it to help with the costs on the team. We put 43 cars on the track every weekend, 43 cars. Each car uh, for a season for 38 races is about 18 to $20 million, excluding driver salaries. So that's your budget, 18 to 20 million, 38 races a year. Compare that to F1. F1, 20 races, a Formula One, 20 races a year, minimum 250 million to 500 million dollars for one car, right? What, you know, you're spending 200, quarter to half a billion dollars for 20 races. Our guys are spending 20 million dollars for 38 races. So you can do the math, you can just, so our model is very, 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 very cost focused because we have to, if we let the costs escalate, we won't get 43 cars on the track every weekend. So we, we spend a lot of time managing the cost to allow, keep the barriers to entry very low so people can come into the sport. So cost is very important, product relevance, and then we get a lot of green initiatives. So basically, that's the why we do it, and that's what we work on. Now what I'm going to try to do is just give you a glimpse of some of these in each one of these, what we do in race analytics, what we do in, in the vehicle, et cetera, et cetera. So in race analytics, uh, basically, that is for us. That's basically our feed feedback loop. We measure the quality of our product, right? We use that data to see what's the quality of the racing and how can we make it better, more entertaining for our fans. The other stuff, the vehicle, the infrastructure, the event, and engagement, that's basically for the fans and broadcasting and the systems and processes, that's kind of behind the, the curtain stuff. That's how we work with our teams and OEMs, how we do our business together. Nobody really needs to know that, but it has to be efficient and has to be done in a very, very smooth way. So as far as the uh, race analytics, here is, for example, this is the Charlotte track. After a race within about an hour, I, we know exactly where every pass happened on the track and who passed who. So this is so we can begin to understand, okay, what was the action like on the track? And we use this because we have GPS on the cars. And then what we do, we break down a pass into its certain elements, pass initiation, the time to execute the pass, the pass time, total complete attempts. So we actually have broken down a pass from one vehicle to another into segments. And then what we do is we get a report on 
how many passes were attempted, how many were completed, how long the passes were, how many happened on the right, how many happened on the left. So this is, this is kind of our fuel to begin. This is one of the things we do, we do many other things. This is one of the things we do to understand the quality of this racing. And our objective is to create more passing because fans like passing, they like close racing, they like lead changes, that's what they like. So we have to try to do this with the car. We can't control the drivers, but and we, it's all got to be fair, so it's actually a pretty interesting science project how to do this. Uh, now, as far as this is uh, safety, here's a, you see a video clip running here. You can see the seat. This is the driver. This, we're doing a sled test here. We just introduced a new uh, belt system into the car, and this is the test where we verified that the belt system works, works very, very, very well. So we spend a lot of time on safety, and I'll, 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 I'll share this with you here. So this is the, this is the crash test, uh, or sorry, this is a sled test to verify. You can see the driver. He's got a head surround, right? And he's got a Hans device on, and obviously we spend a lot of time. We've not had a fatality in NASCAR at the National Series since 2001, okay? So we're very proud of this, and we spend a lot of time working on this. This is now uh, uh, one of the things we did on the head, uh, head space and, and the, uh, the head surround. And you can see very, very critical is the amount of space here. Uh, and so we've uh, put rules in place to manage that, to keep it to, to the proper level. And this is just a, this is a curve that shows you a number of Gs. If you had the one on the left where the space is too big, you were, the head was uh, seeing uh, 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 over 200 Gs of, uh, of, uh, of force. And by, by uh, closing up that space and putting that specification in place, we dropped 50 Gs of, uh, of, uh, of acceleration there on the head. So basically what we do with the body, we take the body, we, we hold the body in tight with a seven-point belt system. And then what we have to do is we have to manage the energy of the head because the head is like on a string. So what we do is have a Hans device. The Hans device holds the head like this. And then the uh, head surround hold, holds the head like this. So... In the old days, uh, when we had a crash, a lot of people thought when the head moved, what happened was they, they, they fractured their, their spine or something. Actually, that's not what happened. When after the head moves, you actually tear the arteries and you bleed to death in about 30 seconds. So all that's been fixed. None of that happens anymore. Very, very controlled, and there's uh, a lot of work that's gone into this, uh, this safety. So just a bit of fun. I went back, and I got a racing in 1933. So this is what it was like, right? This is not us, by the way. This is, I, don't, I can't even know which race this was. We didn't even exist in 1933. We see these guys are running around a track. It's not that clear, but you know, there's an incident here. And, uh, and then you can see, okay, so they're gonna stop the race here. And then what, what do they go and what do they do? Well, they go out there and you know, they're gonna go pick the guys up, right? That was racing in 1933, right? <laughs> kind, of, uh, kind of brutal, so. <laughs> So now we're going to fast forward and show you, okay, what can happen today? I don't show these to you to, and we're not proud of these accidents, but I want to show you the, the amount of science that's gone into solving these problems. So this is, a, uh, this is McDowell, at Texas, in April 2008, and you'll see his crash here. And uh, you will see at the end of this, he gets out and walks out of the car. Imagine that. So, actually, incredible, right? I mean, imagine that. A guy walks out of that car 200 miles an hour, and he can go home to his wife and his kids, right? So we're very, very proud of this. Here's another one. This one was in 2012. This was, uh, this was Paluta Daytona. Uh, pretty bad hit. Um, side by side, coming out of oh, trouble. Two. Around goes the 32 and hard into the wall. Miguel Paluto, hard into the wall, coming out of turn number four. Very reminiscent of... Sure, I lost my breath. But, uh, you know, all in all, it was a good day for us. Start from the... So, <laughs> this is like, so what happens when we have an incident like that? We have the ambulance come out. We, 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 we have medical staff. We take the guy, put him in the ambulance. We take him in, and they, do, they check him, right? We have mandatory concussion baseline testing. We have random drug testing we do every weekend. 
So this would have been about 15 minutes after, after we checked him, he's okay. And so the guy says, hey, not a bad day at the office, right? I mean, imagine that, right? So, so it's a point of pride for us on safety. We work very hard. We dedicate financial and human resources every day in the budget to keep working on this, making it better, better, and better. So now one of the, uh, this is one of our future projects we're working on. Uh, I will talk a bit about what we do at the track. So this is all, I'm still talking about the race vehicle. We're doing a race vehicle. Uh, in this particular video, we are looking at a new barrier that we, that cars go around the track. It's called a safer barrier. But when we were doing this test, we thought one of the incidents that happens sometimes a car hits and it's sitting there, we call it the, the, the sitting duck, and then another car is going to hit it. So when we're testing this wall, we said, let's put a car out there and see how bad this can be. So this is this video. This is a project we're working on. We're going to introduce the, the, uh, the implement, we're going to implement these engineering changes for next season. But this gives you an idea of the kind of issue we're dealing with. So here you'll see that is the new, that's the kind of safer barrier wall we use. And there's the bullet vehicle that's going to strike this sitting duck car. You can see there, uh, there's the incident. Now we're going to watch it from the top view. And then we're going to watch it. So this is from the top. Uh, you can see there's a lot of energy coming in here. Car coming at a huge rate of speed, closing speed. It's going to come off this barrier. You can see that barrier there. He's going to strike. And then, so this is one of the things we're working on now, this, this, this type of incident. You, you, when a car is alone rolling around, we got that one covered. Now we're worried about bullet vehicles hitting. And now we're going to watch this from the inside. You're going to see the camera inside. You're going to see through that window. You're going to see that car come in. You see the seat there. And we're going to see how much we displace the driver uh, in the car. So you'll see there it comes into the car, boom. So what we're doing now is we're gonna, we're gonna, we set up a system, we move all the belts from the chassis to the seat, and the next step is when we hit, we're gonna be moving the seat in the car with the driver to keep them away from this. So that'll be in 416. So that's the kind of work we do in the area of safety. Now, we do more than safety. Right now, the big focus for 16 is aerodynamics and tires. We did work on the chassis and the power. Now we're focused on aerodynamic and tires. And this just gives you kind of the idea of the stuff we do. This is a, you're not supposed to understand this, some of you will, but this is basically computational fluid dynamics. We're doing aerodynamic analysis here. And what we're trying to do is understand the follower car, that type of situation he is in vis-a-vis -vis the lead car. We can see where he's understeering, oversteering, and we use this, this type of modeling to determine what kind of changes to make on the car to improve passing, the ability to pass. And of course, we also are looking at tire loads. We have now, this is measured on a car. We have the ability to calculate all the tire loads on a car from just the GPS and monitoring on the track and directional and banking and all that kind of stuff. We can calculate all that stuff. These are the tools we use to give you an idea of as we work in a race vehicle. Okay, so now let's talk about, I talked about analytics. I talked about uh, the race car. I want to talk about the race infrastructure. Race infrastructure where it was where the cars race, right? This is, uh, we developed what we call the SAFER barrier. SAFER stands for steel and foam energy reduction. Our objective here is to take that kinetic energy and make sure we reduce as much of it to keep the driver safe. What you're gonna see here is a car running into a concrete wall and then you're gonna follow up by a car running into the SAFER barrier, right? And SAFER barrier is something we're implementing on our tracks. So this is into a, uh, into a cement wall. You see the car coming in hits the wall, and quite a bit of intrusion in the passenger compartment. Uh, and then uh, this one here, actually the car's coming in on this one, they're coming in at a higher rate of speed. But you'll see as it hits this safer barrier, this new type of wall construction, it absorbs a lot of the energy and the car goes off. So we put this, put this around the track, outside walls, inside walls. This is the car plus the track infrastructure together is a total safety system for, for the driver, right? So that was that. Now I'm going to show you, uh, uh, this is the event now. We're at the event. We, uh, we have officiated the penalties on pit road with 43 people, each one in a pit box trying to call penalties. This year we've introduced what I call automated pit road officiating. The objective is to improve the accuracy of the sport and to make it fair for everybody. Also increase the safety so we only have 43 officials on pit road. And it also has the ability for us to harvest this data and begin to feed this data up to millennials and broadcasting to enrich the whole, the whole experience. So I've got a video here that kind of explains it. Um, this system has 9,000 times the 
com uh, computer ca capability as the last uh, NASA space uh, shuttle. So this just is a uh, video that kind of show you uh, what it's all about. This trailer is called the Pit Road Officiating Trailer. Essentially, it houses all the technology for us to officiate Pit Road in an automated fashion. We mount approximately 46 cameras. On an oval, they'll be up above the grandstand. 43 of them look at Pit Road, and each look at two boxes, so we have backup capability. We use video feed, but we have computers analyze the video to actually make a call with its whether it's green or red. Then it's reviewed by an official because at times there are extenuating circumstances where the call has to be overridden. So it still has officials viewing it, but the computer makes the initial assessment. Uh, if I was an official uh, sitting in our trailer working the race for the day, I would log in like this and I would immediately start getting pit stops if they were happening on pit road. Example here, um, I'm, getting a, I'm handed this pit stop to officiate. Our system has already automatically told me that they've driven through the forbidden box on exit. So I'll just go ahead and go through this stop quickly and show you how our system can verify that that actually happened. We're able to watch it in double speed just because uh, our system tells us automatically about all the vehicle related violations such as this one that we'll see right here. Here it stops me at the camera shot where he's driving through the fourth pit stall away from him, uh, which is a violation. I approve that and go to the next one. The beauty of this system is we have our officials in a more safe environment. We have less people, less traffic on pit road. We also have a more accurate way of officiating the sport. We're going to be able to feed this data to fans and broadcasting to actually show penalties. And we're actually going to be able to feed uh, data and video to teams so they can see their infractions and their pit time. So it'll get everybody an enhanced level of understanding the sport. So we rolled this out with the start of the Daytona 500. We were running it in the background uh, with our manual system for about uh, 15 races. So we were running as a beta version, making sure it worked, and it's, it's, it's out there now. Uh, another thing, of course, is uh, we've got huge tracks when it rains. It's, uh, can you imagine, right? We're racing on Sunday, and we've got to get the other side of the country by next Sunday. If we have a rain delay, tough to do. We've got you know, 120,000, 150,000 people in the stands wanting to watch this thing. It's raining. We have to delay it one day. It costs it's the cost the industry about twenty million dollars a day. So we needed to develop a way to dry a track very quickly. So when I got when I got there, this is one of the first assignments I got. So we cranked this project out. I think we did this in like nine months, right? So and uh, the objective here is to dry the track as quickly as possible. So what we do is we get the water off to begin the evaporation process, and we've managed to make. Uh, a Huge inroads. Uh, we we the drying now it takes us about a, a third as long as it used to. So I've got another video here that kind of gives you an idea about what all this was about. The fastest way to slow the excitement of a NASCAR race is to suffer through a rain delay. When NASCAR Sprint Cup Series driver Jeff Gordon took over third place in career wins. The historic moment came on a Tuesday afternoon. A celebration delayed for nearly 36 hours. America's largest spectator sport has worked to maintain race-ready conditions throughout its history. In 2013, NASCAR Research and Development unveiled the NASCAR Air Titan System, immediately seeing results and salvaging races from substantial delays. NASCAR Air Titan 2.0 is the vision of NASCAR Chairman Brian France, an improved system delivered by NASCAR Research and Development, continuing the tradition of NASCAR leading innovation across all sports. An eye for improved safety and streamlined maneuverability makes Air Titan 2.0 more viable for paved tracks of all shapes and sizes. 
NASCAR Air Titan 2.0 implements a more than 200% increase in drying capacity. That equates to drying the area of a football field in 20 seconds using a volume of air that would fill the Goodyear blimp in less than four minutes. Air Titan 2.0 is also 80% more fuel efficient. It has been re-engineered to be carried by a single Toyota Tundra and requires fewer support vehicles than before. And it works seamlessly with the Elgin Eco-Infused Track Sweeper. The time, money, and energy saved by Air Titan 2.0 is substantial. But more importantly, it allows NASCAR to keep momentum on the side of competition and excitement in the hearts of cheering fans. Weather will still impact events like the Daytona 500, but NASCAR's improved Air Titan 2.0 will shorten delays caused by washed out racetracks. For NASCAR, delaying history is not an option, but creating history is. So we start with Air Titan 1. The problem with it, it was rather big, it was awkward. So now we've got this more elegant solution. We have 22 units, and depending on the size of the track, we'll deploy eight at a smaller track. At a large track, like Daytona, we'll deploy all 22. And if it rains, then they go into action, and we dry off the track, are ready to go. Okay, so next is the, this is fan engagement. Uh, this is now the kind of stuff we're going to show. This is actually from that automated pit road officiating. I'm going to show you here kind of how this, what we can show the fans and broadcasting. We're feeding this up to broadcasting. They show it on television. This is going to be the 46 car. So you can look for the 46 car. He's going to go into pit box 26. And the guys aren't allowed, seven crew members aren't allowed to jump over the wall until uh, one pit box away. So what you're going to see here is the cars are going to be about six inches from the red line. You're going to see two guys in the pit box we call a penalty. And then this we feed up to broadcasting so you can show, and then we're going to, we feed this up to our fans so they can understand that. So this is, this is sped up a bit, too, so it's not exactly the most elegant, but this is, this is the way it looks. So see, you'll see the 46. Here he is. He's coming in. He can't drive in that uh, red box. He's okay. He didn't drive into the box. He's, he's, there's 20. He's going to come in the pit box. There's 27. He's going to come in at 26. There's the line. And see, he's already got two guys in the box, penalty. So we call that penalty right there on them because they can't jump into the box. And now they're finishing off their, uh, off their uh, uh, the pit stop here. Uh, it's about a 13, 14 second pit stop penalty. And then, uh, and then they're out. So every, every one is monitored, but the computer just calls the ones that are a problem. Those are the ones we focus on. If they're good, why spend all the time looking at the good ones? We're just going to look at the problem children, right? So that's what that is. So that, uh, okay, so now... Uh, this is the last one. These are systems and processes. So, you know, how we do the work with our teams. We used to publish a rule book every year, a little rule book, and we'd give it to them, and then there's changes, and by the time they got it, there was already, it was out of date. So we went to total electronic rule book here, internet-based. It's got all the rules and everything from what kind of drug testing we do to uh, how, you, how you enter an event, and in there in section 20 tells you how to build a car. They got 300 engineering drawings in there. They can pull up real time, see how to build a car. And up there, every time we issue a technical bulletin, and some kind of change, bing, they get it automatically. Like you get an email, all the teams get it and they say, technical bulletin, all instantaneously communicated at one time so everybody knows what's going on. So this is a system to help the teams do their business in a better way. Okay, so now I've kind of gone through some of the history. I've kind of gone with doing innovation. Now I'm going to kind of go on the last part here, which is, uh, oh yeah, by the way, we have a NASCAR Hall of Fame. It's in Charlotte. Uh, very nice building. It's, uh, it's like three stories, and it's got like a track that goes up, and all the cars from starting from the beginning to the end, and it shows the different tracks and all that, and it shows safety development. So it's located in Charlotte, so there's a Hall of Fame there. Okay, so the last part now is uh, messaging brand positioning. So what I'm going to do is here kind of show you kind of how we try to position the product with some, some commercials. This one's called Twist, and this one is really to try to demonstrate how unpredictable and dramatic NASCAR is. This one we put together in, in 2013. I'll kind of walk you for 13, 14, 15, kind of show you some of our creative and messaging. So here's Twist. For every turn, a twist. For every start, an untimely finish. For every win, 
someone who loses it. For every number, a nation. For every celebration, a brawl. For every split second, years of work. For every heaven, a hell. For every good old boy, a good old girl. For every curse, a prayer. For every ounce of order, a jug of chaos. For every twist, there's a turn. So that was 2013. Now, interesting, uh, one of the things you saw there was every race we have uh, troops at the track. We recognize the military. We bring in uh, uh, people who had issues, uh, you know, lost limbs and all that. We always treat them very specially, and it's always a very important uh, part of our race weekend to, to thank the military for what they do. This one is called machine, and what this one tries to do is position our drivers as athletes. They are athletes, and it draws in comparison to vehicle technology. So this was uh, this is something we did in four, in fourteen. So that was uh, Jimmy Johnson, and that was uh, Carl Edwards, and Casey Kane were the three drivers, so they were in that commercial. And actually, uh, Jimmy Johnson, he's, he's a triathlete. He, he runs, he bikes, he's very, very, very fit. Uh, next one here is called uh, Heroes. Now what this one tries to do is build the star power drivers, but also tries to get at the youth, the millennials, which is one of, one of, uh, one of our objectives. Heroes. Every night when I fall asleep, I dream of flying. I dream of being an athlete. Being a king. I dream of being a knight in shining armor. Being fearless. A good guy. A hero. Being bad. Real bad. I dream of being a ten. I dream of mayhem. Chaos. Like thunder. I dream of donuts. That's my dream. That's my dream. Mine too. I dream of being a race car driver. That's one of my favorites. I like the donut part of it. <laughs> uh, this next one is, now this is 15. This is what we're going for 15. And really, the, we're building nowhere but NASCAR. That's going to be the theme as we set, set for 15 as we go to market. Uh, and this is a kind of an anthem to set that whole, whole thing up, kind of a historical uh, 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 shot here of setting up this for 15. this, they wouldn't have done that, or that, this, definitely not that, wouldn't have had him, those for pity, them, that, that, those, or this, not that. Gatto bumped by Denny Hamlin. Not that. Or this. But luckily, they did all that. Because you can't find this anywhere else. So that's kind of, uh, and the next couple ones are some of the stuff we're going to roll up 15. And what we try to do here is plant them, but then also tell the fan when the next race is is. Uh, this one's called Friends Until They're Not, and really what we're trying to do here is showcase the drivers, but also the intense competition and, uh, and, and you know, the competition between the drivers. We run in a pack, a company of renegades. The roar of the engine, our mother tongue, the bump and run, 
our secret handshake. We're 43 comrades in harm. We're a circle of friends. Until we're not. Atlanta, Sunday, March 1st at 1, only on Fox. So that one we would have run during the Daytona broadcast to set up Atlanta. We just came from Atlanta, right? And this is another one here. This one's called Regular Season and really the importance of winning. And one thing I didn't mention, we have 36 races. 26 of them are the regular season, and 10 would be our playoffs. And in that 10, we have an elimination uh, where we knock cars out. So it's a, something we introduced last year. It's been hugely successful. And the urgency of winning is very, very important because if you win, you're in. If you don't, you're out. So that's what this one tries to, uh, tries to bring home. Look around. Where do you see regular? You can't call this a regular season. They need to get a win. I see nations and battles. We said what would drivers do to make it happen? Triumph and hurt. I see every win now. Attack Gordon and Keselowski. The world turned upside down. Where else is the regular season? Far from record. Someone could steal a chase spot here today. Nowhere but NASCAR. Live from Atlanta, Sunday, March 1st at 1, only on Fox. Okay, now this one is, we have a fantasy game. So this is kind of, we kind of gives you an idea of this one. This is kind of a fun one. <laughs> What's up? I'm Zach Buckner, owner of Fantasy Team Can't Touch This. And uh, these are my drivers. I got the Hapster, uh, Double A, Larson, <laughs> Easy B, and uh, DJ Craze. That's not my nickname. It is here. Questions? Where else can you take charge and join the battle of the fantasy nations? Nowhere but NASCAR Fantasy Live. Sign up at nascar.com slash fantasy. So we've we've had a bit of work to do this one on this one. So we're kind of pushing uh, pushing this, and uh, it's starting to work pretty good for us. Um, this one's called "I Talked to You About uh, About Acceleration Nation STEM Program." This is a commercial about that. This is Carl Edwards. He's one of our drivers. He's the guy that jumps whenever he wins. He jumps from the car up, you know, does the flip. You saw that. So this is Carl. Uh, he's he's a very athletic guy. So this is uh, this is called Ice Cream. Today we're going to talk about drag, and that can slow an object down. So in NASCAR, is this good or bad? Layla? Bad, because when you go slow, you lose. You lose. Sponsors disappear. No one will talk to you. All of a sudden, your jokes aren't funny. But when you go fast, you win, and you feel happy. Plus, your parents take you out for ice cream. You had me down, and you brought me right back up. To the bus. I'm driving. We're getting some ice cream. NASCAR Acceleration Nation, where kids can play games and learn math and science the NASCAR way. Go to accelerationnation.com to get started today. Uh, and then uh, this is the last one. So uh, NBC returning, uh, and this is, they're already starting to position advertise. They've got the second half of the season. So this is basically, you know, because they're going to be on NBC and NBC Sports Network. So they're going to start in July, uh, the July weekend. So this is their kind of commercial and placement on uh, getting ready for that. <laughs> Okay, so that's kind of, uh, hopefully I painted a picture for you. Um, 
I yeah, we guess we're gonna have a question and answer. I, I you know uh, the, I uh, <coughs> so you had a busy schedule while you come up here. I, I got to tell you, I spent two years here doing my MBA, and uh, to me that was a watershed experience for me. So I I come here with a lot of pride. I mean, it prepared me well for the work I do. So uh, uh, you know, it, it's nice to be back here, uh, back home, and uh, at the school. So <coughs> that.